All right, welcome to uh, the program, Jeffrey James. Uh, good to uh, talk to you and finally have you on the program. We've been uh, in contact for a little bit here for a while, so it's uh, it's nice to finally talk to you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. Now, uh, you come from the, uh, well, I guess the business world, we can say as well, Jeffrey. You're, you're a freelance writer, uh, but you do write you know, a blog about sales for CBS Interactive, a, a column for Inc.com. Uh, you've had your work published in Wired, the New York Times, and, and Computer World. So that's an interesting contrast to uh, your interest when it comes to uh, John Dee, Enochian Magic, etc. And now we have a new novel come, come out here called uh, Sorcerer, a novel of Queen Elizabeth's Alchemist. And uh, your previous book, Jeffrey, on the subject was The Enochian Evocation of John Dee. And uh, that's a reprint, as I understand it, of uh, your previous one called The Enochian Magic of Dr. John Dee, the most powerful system of magic in its original. So what was your initial interest in, in, in John Dee and Enochian magic, Jeffrey? Well, I uh, took, did my degree work in English at the University of California, Irvine, uh, where I was uh, magna cum laude and uh, Rhodes Candidate Scholarship for, this, for the, the university, that particular branch of the university. And uh, while I was there, I became interested in the uh, uh, concept of magical writings, you know, the writings, things that people had written, like magical workbooks, as a form of literature. And I uh, specifically got there through looking at Dr. Faustus, which was, I thought, a very, I thought, the best Elizabethan play. I, I think it's superior in many ways to, to Shakespeare's work. So I started becoming more interested in that. And then I discovered that there was a person a real person who lay behind Dr. Faustus. And it's not the German Dr. Faustus, who was actually a historical personage, but the character of Dr. Faustus in Marlowe's play is based on Dr. John Dee. And so I uh, started looking into biographies of John Dee and looking at um, what little pieces of his works were available. Now, this was in the early 1970s which was a uh, kind of a time of great efflorescence of republishing of uh, old magical texts, both in their original and stuff from the Victorian period uh, that had been republished. And so there was a lot of activity around that. So I started collecting books on the subject and ran across a book, a reproduction of a book that had been published in the mid-17th century of John Dee's diaries. And uh, very complicated, you know, this person said this, and that, and I, it was this great mystery. I just said, well, what's this all about? So I started reading about it, and I subsequently started writing articles about the subject. This is while I, I actually while I was in college, and um, and continued continued it as a hobby for many years. Uh, and then in 1984, I think it was, I published um, the original version of the of the notebooks. Uh, which was called, which was called Enochian Evocation, and that was um, that was published in uh, hardback on acid-free paper on a hundred-year-old printing press with you know like the letter wow. press where they yeah it was nice. it's actually very cool and copies of that book now regularly go for five six hundred dollars yeah I saw that this is this amazing yeah they're very rare yeah. yeah it's very rare and it's remained in print it it was just remained in print and paperback pretty much ever since then. Um, but those original publications are really, really quite valuable. Uh, in the meanwhile, while I was, you know, I graduated from college, and uh, I'd always, at the same time, it, it's not too surprising, interest in literature. Also, I was always interested in, in computers, and I had, um, I had computer time in college. You know, got a chance to use a computer, and, and uh, I thought it was very fascinating. So I became involved uh, professionally in the computer industry. And for 12 years, uh, worked in a development group, and then in another, for another seven years, worked in a marketing group. And so that allowed me to understand a lot about the about both about technology, but also about the way the business world worked. Because in the marketing world, I ended up working with a lot of CEOs and Fortune 500 companies and things like that. So, and, and while I and this was all kind of happening, you know, yeah, I kind of was looking at the ma the magical stuff as as a hobby. And I had started working on a novel be on the subject because I thought this is a great story. I want to tell the story how it really was from the, their viewpoint. I'd already published the notebooks. Now I wanted to do a story. And so that's where the novel was coming from. And then over the years, I've become uh, um, fairly well known as a writer on business and uh, sales and marketing, but also uh, also high technology. I wrote 
a book called The Tao of Programming, which is that's right, yeah, per- <laughs> perennially popular. And uh, so, so that was my that that's been my career as a writer, and I'm I'm quite successful at it. And I have a, a, another book coming out in the called Business Without the Bullshit that's coming out in uh, in next next year from Business Plus, which is a big big imprint. And so I have this career as career as a writer and as a writer on, on on kind of corporate culture, but I still maintain an interest in the subject matter of John D. and his life. And I've been working on this novel, uh, draft after draft after draft, you know, kind of learning the craft of writing, learning how to tell a story, learning how to not make a novel bad history, but a good novel. <laughs> and so I ended up then uh, completing the novel, getting an agent for it, and getting a publisher. And uh, so now it's been published, and that so that's and that's why we're talking now is because that's I'm I'm want people to, to, who are interested in the subject matter to be aware that the novel now exists and provides a key to understanding John Dee's work and, and, and the, the way that he practiced magic and the way that he thought about magic. So let's talk a little bit about the novel Sorcerer and, and kind of what advantage this gave you instead of doing it you know, in, in the other way in terms of the Enochian evocation of John Dee that you were previously and kind of, I guess, why you wanted to do it this way, because you were trying to reach a different level with, with this, and, and you, I guess you discovered that novel format is, is the way to go. The reason that I chose a novel is because it is, it, you kind of have two choices when you want to explain, when you have a story. I, there was a story there that I, I felt need telling, and telling it in the context of the history uh, is is valuable, but it's so the history requires a whole lot of effort to understand how the different pieces fit together. And there's some there's been some great biographies of John D. Uh, my my favorite one is one by Benjamin Woolley called The Queen's Conjurer. And if you're interested in the actual history and how it all fits together, and that's an excellent book. Uh, what it can't tell you is what are the psychological states that people get into when they're practicing ritual magic and and what is it like um, because it is a changing it's a conscious a, a form of consciousness changing so writing about looking at a biography of d is kind of like looking at a biography of a tibetan monk it doesn't really you know, he sat there for a long time and meditated <laughs> you know it's like what does that tell you right. about his state of consciousness of what hap- what what is happening to him or how he feels internally um, it doesn't tell you anything. So, in order to get into that, I felt the best way to understand would be to tell a to tell a story. And the book is told from uh, multiple points of view, but never breaks point of view. And this is something that 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 was absolutely essential to the subject matter. When D is performing a ceremony, all he sees is Edward Kelly looking into a stone and saying things. That's all he sees, because that's all he saw. That's all that he notes in his diaries. There was one, one instance where something odd happened, which we can talk about later, but, but that's what his experience was. Edward Kelly's experience was apparently quite different. He actually had these visions and was seeing things, was kind of like being sent into a, a state of semi-controlled schizophrenia might be a good way to put it, hmm. where he would see these visions and these and hear voices. And so his experience was, was extremely different from the experience that John D. had. The experience of the two wives who traveled around with them was different. They, they didn't see either. They, they saw you know, what, that they were, their lives were being upset and changed and they were having to travel all over the place because these angels talking through... Edward Kelly and telling Dee what to do was telling everyone where they had to go and what they had to do. And so it became a question of do, do we, how far do we believe what, that this is real? And so the experience is, uh, in the book is, is told from the actual viewpoints of the characters, which is the way life is. You're in something or you're not in it. You're seeing something, you're thinking and what you're thinking. And, and, um, that was the challenge and that was the key to telling the story in the way that I did was that it doesn't 
you can read the whole thing and you can say, you can say, wow, magic's real because that's what they saw. But you could also stand back from it and say, well, that was just what they were perceiving. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas if it was told like a Harry Potter book, magic's real in that world. Okay. It's real in the world that they create. So the Lord of the Rings, just something like that. Um, or if you, this is more like you don't really know whether it's real because all you see it is through the eyes of the people involved. And then the case for its reality has to be made by their experience and what they saw and how it seemed to them. Very interesting. I want to get more into this, of course, into the magic, you know, the angels or encounters, if you will, the, the linguistics behind that, the, the techniques, mm-hmm. etc. But I would just, just a couple of things here before we go there. Your novel then is based on on their diaries. This is to reach a certain level of accuracy with the novel, uh, because the the diaries is what explains uh, their experience. Correct. The other thing about a novel, yes, that's true. And you, a lot of the dialogue is literally taken out of the diaries. What I did change was the historical context a little bit to make the story simpler. And uh, for example. When they traveled, they traveled with multiple servants and a bunch of kids. I left out the kids and the servants because it just it was too much effort to. You had to have saying, "Oh, the kids are over here and the servants are over here." It's just too complicated and strange <laughs> for people to understand. Also, um, it was difficult to understand. Dee's wife was pretty obviously very beautiful. You can tell from the reactions that, like princes and counts and stuff have to her. They're always giving her gifts and stuff. You, you, you can just, you, the context is, is there. Um, it's a little difficult for people to think about someone who's had eight kids being considered, you know, at, at her sexual peak. But of course, that's the way they thought about it then. So I just said, okay, well, to make it more realistic in a sense or more understandable, I'll just simplify that part out. I also simplified the travels a little bit. They go back and forth from Krakow to Prague about three or four times. Mm-hmm. I, uh, they go to Krakow, then they go to Prague. You know, I just left out the the peregrinations to simplify it. So it was that sort of change um, where I just simplified the story so that it was easier to understand what was going on. Otherwise, it'd get it'd get tied up in details that really weren't, frankly, all that important. We do not need to spend too much time on the biography. We, we've talked about John Dee a little bit in the past in the program, but what do you think our listeners should know about Dee's backstory, uh, you know, what we know about him as, as a man, and, and then how he came onto this uh, you know, path in, in his life? Well, he was a, um, a, a driven man. He was obsessed with um, discovering what he called radical knowledge. And that's the term he used. And what he meant by that was uh, knowledge that was beyond what people had, had learned before, up to and including the ability to transmute lead into gold, the ability to create miraculous medicines like the elixir of life. Uh, he also wanted so wanted to usher in um, much of the things that we take for, for granted in the world today. He was interested in how can you communicate long distance instantaneously? How can you fly through the air? So he was in many ways... Um, a thinker similar to uh, Leonardo da Vinci, or and also Galileo. Um, so he's in that that general milieu of of, of, early, of early scientific thinkers. He reached a point when he was in his early 50s, where he felt he had pretty much learned everything there was to learn out of books. He compiled Europe's largest library, about 5,000 volumes. I think about half printed, half manuscript. He uh, was well recognized as the world's greatest scholar at the time. Uh, Some of his works, he hadn't published a lot, but what had been published was very well received. And uh, he was having a large influence in the government in terms of, in terms of setting the British Empire, uh, building the concept that the British Empire was necessary, helping with navigational instruments. We so were extremely successful, but he was also extremely frustrated because even though he'd figured out all these things, radical knowledge was still escaping him. He wanted more than what was possible to be accomplished then. Now, there's a critical difference in the way that John Dee thought about science 
and the way that we think about science. We think about science as a as a progression of the scientific method. You test, you you know, you do a theory, you a hypothesis, you test it, it becomes a theory, then it becomes a strong theory, and so forth. That is not the way that John Dee thought about it, and not the way that most of John Dee's contemporaries thought about it. They thought that all knowledge existed in the mind of God, and that the perfect scientist had been Adam because he'd been closest to the mind of God and the next perfect scientist had been Enoch, the prophet, because he had walked with God. And the way they saw science was the Egyptians were able to do stuff like build the pyramids and do all these amazing things that they had read about in, um, in various texts. And they were they had more knowledge than the Greeks had and the Romans had less knowledge. And they, he saw knowledge as slipping away and he wanted to reestablish it. And his idea was, and if you think of the way that he was thinking about knowledge, it makes perfect sense. He said the only way to get radical knowledge, to get the knowledge of the Egyptians, the knowledge that they had, the knowledge that the Greeks had, the knowledge that the Romans had, the knowledge, all the knowledge that it would be possible for people to have would be to connect to the mind of God and extract it from God's mind in the same way that Enoch had it, had walked with God or that the prophets had walked with the angels. So he said, so then it became, once he decided, I'm going to get radical knowledge by communicating with God, it became a technological problem for him. How do you do that? And the only way that he knew how to do it and the way that made sense to do it was by using ritual magic, by using these books of magic that said, here's how you call angels into, uh, into a crystal stone, here's how you communicate with them. And he believed that if he, could, he, he would start communicating with them, they would reveal the secrets that he wanted to know, and then he would be able to do these amazing things that, he, that for him was important to be able to do. Fascinating. When did he meet uh, Edward Keller, then his uh, scryer? He met him um, not long after he decided to do this. He, he experimented with a couple of other people and, um, and got kind of um, mixed results. And then he uh, ran across Edward Kelly, and Edward Kelly immediately started um, relating ver fairly complicated visions, and um, often with really odd details, long lists of letters in, in, arranged into a matrix and stuff that sounded like, if you look at it, it looks like a, a, a whole new language um, where it seems to have grammar and syntax. Even at the beginning, that seemed to be the case. You know, at one part, one point, the, um, he starts talking in, in, in Hebrew and that's not a language that Edward Kelly knew. There were also some odd things in the way that the um, the angels, uh, when he was in a trance, he he was able, or as it were, or seeing, you know, brought into this the state and was looking in the stone. He would talk much. He would communicate in much better Latin than he communicated when he was not, hmm. and he was capable of kind of simultaneously if you think of it as coming out of his own head, he was capable while he was in these states of um, extemporaneously coming out with an almost unbelievably poetic, uh, beautiful, eldritch, frightening stuff. And then when he's writing on his own, Edward Kelly was, he was like absolutely the worst writer. I mean, <laughs> boring and trite and just, you know, his poetry was doggerel, la da 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 You know, <laughs> seriously, it was almost like limerick, his <laughs> personal writing. So there's something very strange going on when a person in one state is just dropping off the top of his mouth some of the greatest literature of, of uh, if you can call it, I don't mean to compare it with, with great literature like Shakespeare, but, but coming out of his mouth... Um, Certainly, you know, very powerful passages and powerful writings and these pieces of, of what seem to be other languages or seem to be maybe invented languages, uh, extremely complicated tables, 
and yet as as a person he was seemed unable to do any of that at all or even completely uninterested in doing any of that at all so right. it, it's actually fairly fascinating and argues for the fact that the experience that he was having um, was either setting free some kind of latent creativity in his mind uh, in which case some he was in, in which case he was doing something incredibly amazing because as we'll be talking about they, they, he came up with a, a language with its own grammar and syntax and vocabulary that would be similar to J.R.R. Tolkien coming up up with Elvish on the fly on th in three days right that's what that would be like hmm. and uh, so if he did that he was a linguistic prodigy um, if if he didn't do that then then you have to come up with some other explanation, one of which is maybe he was in touch with something that that uh, we don't understand or that they don't understand. How did they go about uh, approaching this initial problem here? I mean, as you said, uh, I think you alluded to this, that it was based on previous ritual magic that they knew and other kinds of techniques because, uh, I mean, where do you begin, right, to, to, to go into this and, and find out how to do it? He built... Most of the, the beginning uh, of it, then the theory on it, was built on the works of uh, Cornelius Agrippa. Right. Uh, specifically, the three books of occult philosophy. Probably not the fourth one. Um, he wasn't working. He, he it was very important to him. Very important to him to John D. Uh, to avoid um, any contact with anything that could be considered a demon. He only wanted to talk with angels. And so he started out with a very simple, um, simple ceremony, just prayers, and you know, and that most of which were written by him, and uh, to, uh, kind of based on some of the stuff that he'd he'd, he'd read, but apparently not, not. Um, I, I, I'm not even sure that there that is any record of of what ones he originally used, but part of the concept of the way that they envisioned heaven is relevant here. Uh, it was thought of at that time as a uh, much like a royal court, heaven was, with God as the king, and then he had his counselors around him, and then they had their assistants, and then under them were a whole bunch of servants, and then under them was a whole bunch of underservants, and then under them were a whole bunch of people, gardeners, and stuff like that. The idea was that there were levels of angel of angelic power, yeah, heavenly hierarchy. Just like you wanted, if you wanted to go see the king, you'd have to start at the gate and talk your way through the gatekeeper, first gatekeeper. Then you'd have to talk your way into the castle. <laughs> then you have to talk your way into the royal chamber. Then you're going to talk your way into the royal bedroom to have a conversation, or the you know the the presence room. So they. The way he saw it was, well, we're going to start with the lowest level of angels, and they'll tell us how to get to the next level, and they'll tell us how to get to the next level. And so, in the process, each level revealed that here is the magical formula, the, the conjurations and the names of the angels and the times that you need to do it. That will allow you to get to the next level. And so, the during the process, they the 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 process created three un unique sets of magical ceremonies that are not they're part partly related but partly unrelated to each other one of which is based on the seven planets one of which is based on the 12 uh, zodiacal signs and one of which is based on the four elements and the one that was supposed to take them over the top was the one based on the four four elements that was the one that was supposed to reveal all the secrets how would a typical session, if we can call it that, look? Uh, verbal communications, visual uh, things, you know, describe this a little bit. It was, they had, um, they built special, um, there's actually some fairly detailed descriptions of their, uh, of how they set things up. And a number of the items have survived in the British Library. Um, but, the one that's best described is the one that was the um, heptarchal system, the one that's based on the planets. And for that, you had a, you, you'd have a clean floor. You know, I'll just build you up what it looked like. You had a clean floor. Then you had wax, four wax tablets 
with this uh, sigil called the Sigil of Emeth on it, four wax tablets, and then a four-legged table. And then over that, ta under the, t on top of the table was another sigil of Emeth, bigger, like maybe about a foot, a foot across. But, and that one still exists in the British Library and had a little indentation in the top of it. And then there was a rainbow colored cloth thrown over the top, held down by tassels in the four corners. And a crystal ball, which was not big, it was actually pretty small, it was only about, and that is in the British Museum too, it's about maybe two half, two inches across, sat on top of the rainbow cloth in the indentation on the, um, on the sigil of Emma. And then they would sit, D would sit on one side with a notebook because he had to record everything that happened. And on the other side would be uh, Edward Kelly who would look into uh, the crystal and s explain what he saw and what he heard. D the ceremonies usually started with D um, with a set of prayers to kind of sanctify the uh, temple. Uh, they kind of, I believe they call it that, to sanctify it and then Sometimes he would ask for a particular type of angel to come down, and sometimes he'd just say anyone who's hanging around, kind of, they, who they were talking to. They had some of the entities that Kelly communicates with, actually, if, when you read them, start to have like their own personality. Some of them are kind of cranky, <laughs> but some of them are kind of uh, sweet. Like there's, a, uh, there's one angel that, Kelly keeps on talking about called Medimi, who's a little girl. And she sometimes seems like a little girl and talks like a little girl. And it's actually kind of, it's very interesting the way that, that uh, it's almost like Kelly was doing like a radio play in, in a sense, where he was talking, you know, he, he, these people were saying this and he's writing it all down in detail, whatever, what everyone said. Um, he typically just did a quick notation, this is how we opened it, and then he gets into what he recorded were the discussions, and he would ask questions, and the, um, they, the, the angels, through Kelly's voice, would answer. Sometimes Kelly would interject his own opinion or ask his own question, so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't completely out of it all the time. Uh, although sometimes there's long periods where, where ever Kelly doesn't say anything at all, where it's just D, talking to the angels and mm -hmm. talking through him to this, uh, you know, to what he believed were, uh, were, you know, supernatural beings. Could we term this as being channeling, basically, some of the elements that we have, you know, coming through us today through the New Age, etc.? Yeah, yeah, the channeling is a good way. Another, um, there was a, a, another part of it that was almost a little bit like a Ouija board, where there was, uh, they had tables of letters and, um, and Edward would see the angels pointing at the different letters, and D would write down the letters in order. So some of it was channeling, and, and some of it was kind of like automatic writing. But not automatic writing in the sense that Edward Kelly was writing with his hand, but he, was, he would like see, okay, that's a B, and now an A, now a C, now a Q, now an R, now an A, now a, and, and like that. I guess many of these uh, sessions, then, if we can call it that, and kind of work themselves forward, if you will, and kind of develop the whole methodology of the of the uh, you know the angelic hierarchy, if you will, uh, the language itself. Uh, under how long of a period do you think that this just kind of developed and and turned into what it is today? I you know I should be able to quote you the exact dates that it happened, but it was primarily from the period of about 1581 to 1587. If I remember correctly, but it was in the 1580s when all this all this happened. Yeah. And meanwhile, the angels were telling them to do stuff. Oh, go to Europe. You know, go talk to the Holy Roman Emperor. Huh. Uh, go do this. Um, they were also predicting the end of the world, and um, uh, a couple of times they predicted that D and Kelly would find um, treasure hoards, which they never did. So did they, uh, and, did they um, lie? And at one point, at one point, um, when they got to the highest level of angels and called them, they, um, the angels said, okay, well, if you really want the big secrets, you're going to have to change something. You're all going to have to 
uh, you're going to have to sw- swap your wives. And um, that was came as a pretty big surprise to 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 D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, 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 you can imagine it. But 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 do they do it? And it sounds a little it sounds a little strange if you think of the angels as being specifically Christian, or if you think of them pursuing a partic- uh, specifically Christian way of looking at things. Right. But yeah. If you look at uh, any cult, which is kind of what they were creating in a way, it was like a little family level cult, the idea of some kind of unusual sexual practice almost always pops up. Hmm. It may be unusual, like celibacy, which is unusual and odd. It may be polygamy, like in the Mormon church, or in um, stuff like David Koresh. It may be. I mean, it just comes up. It's it's a it's a it's it's a common element of any experience like this. Is that um, you, you're going to be doing something that's outside of your normal, what you would normally consider moral sexual uh, magic. I think they're 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 using sexual energy in some way, right? Or um, I believe that 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 was that was part of it. Um, yeah. There's a really, there's a very telling moment when um, D he records this in his diary where he broaches the matter to his wife, uh, who was, uh, I believe, the word he uses is astonished. And but eventually, but her comment after she's thought about it is a little, little bit as that that it would be all right as long as she's not much inconvenienced. That was her. right. That was her. That was her 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 charge as long as it's not not you know not not much inconvenience. But, wow, uh, she was a real work. I'll tell you. Why. <laughs> one time, one time, um, uh, one time she was um, frequently uh, furious. To play. He would write a lot about how angry she was, how angry she got at Edward Kelly, how angry she got at got at. One point, she hits one of her daughters in the head so hard that the kid bleeds out the ear. Hmm. So she was not a nice, particularly. She does not come off well in these diaries, and she doesn't come off particularly well in the book either. I tried to capture, you know, the attitude of someone who, who could do something like that, and who was that kind of on the edge of always blowing up and becoming, you know, and probably was kind of nutty herself, frankly. <laughs> Why do you think that Ke- uh, Kelly was so good? At this, it seems like certain people, you know, even today, they just have that kind of ability to, well, pass between worlds, tap into other realities, if you will. Is this the case with Kelly as well? It would seem that he's a, he was a, a natural at it. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, if if you read any biography, of the, uh, the, the assumption is always made. Um, Biographies by you know historians has always made that he was simply a con man who was making it all up. It's hard to understand how someone could make up all that stuff and all that stuff that quickly. Uh, and what's probably the case, which is the case with many, uh, is that he was making some of it up. And some of it was just coming right off the top of his head, and some of it was coming from who knows where. So you really don't know. But some of the things that he came up with are very difficult, are a little, are almost impossible to explain um, without some kind of occult explanation, just because they're so so darned odd. Um, the Enochian language, actually, it's called the angelic language, but the, the angelic language that was dictated, for example, it was um, tapped out letter by letter, half forwards, half backwards. And um, and then the English gloss, in other words, this is what it means, what each word means, uh, was came out a completely different time, and there's no significant mismatches. Hmm. Now, you could probably do that if you had a crib sheet. But it would be awfully hard to have a crib sheet when someone's sitting right next to you. 
Right. You know, you think D would have noticed if you were like checking sure. his, you know, and we're talking hundreds of words and um, complicated matches, some forwards, some backwards. I mean, if you, if probably too complicated, to, way too complicated to memorize, even if he, he had taken the time to create it all himself. So now we have this phenomenon of this very strange language coming seemingly out of nowhere with its own grammar and its own syntax and its own weirdnesses. Um, some of it's very German-like, some of it's Latin-like, some of it's English-like. Um, it's, it's some, of it, some of the words are Hebrew or seem to be related to Hebrew. So it's, it's just a mystery, uh, a, big, uh, a mystery of how, how this could have been done or how he could have done this and not had something unusual going on. Yeah, yeah. You were saying that this is the, the linguistic evidence, you know, that, that angels are, are real. How, how did they, do you think they make the distinction if they, because uh, I think you were alluding to this earlier, that they, they weren't interested in contacting demons. They wanted to talk with angels. But how did they make that distinction and determine basically of who they were talking to and how they, that they were genuine, I guess? Well... I think part of it was angels are as angels do. <laughs> so they were, you know, they would test them and they'd look to see whether what what was being said through Edward Kelly actually made uh, theological sense. But frequently they questioned. They'd say, "Oh, they, you know, they'd say, no, these have to, they have to be deceivers." In fact, when the life swapping command came down, that was a big deal. And caused just about everyone to say, okay, okay, this is enough. You know, this is ridiculous. This is can't possibly be, you know, uh, angels. But they continued on anyway because uh, I, partly because of momentum and partly because the they had so many proofs that they believed were convincing that made them um, uh, believe in the reality of the experience. And also the potential benefits of going through with it. Uh, because if you actually did, of course, get that radical knowledge, you'd immediately become uh, the richest and most powerful person in the world. I mean, if you really did find the Philosopher's Stone, you would be able to turn an iron pot into gold. You would be able to make a medicine that would instantly cure old age. So the benefits that they were looking at from their perspective were worth the risk of uh, possibly consorting with um, with demons. But mm. they managed to 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 reposition it all in their mind, no matter what happened, that they were talking that that they were just angels. And at the end of his life, um, D made it real clear. Says I've never I never talked to any demons. Hmm. Very interesting. So what kind of uh... I don't know what to call it, instructions. I mean, we're talking about things from personal advice to suggestions to maybe even, you know, commandments coming down, if you will, from the hierarchy of of angels and archangels. And, and uh, I would guess as well, Jeffrey, that this extended further out into, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, how the, John D's position in terms of the relationship to the Elizabethan court, uh, political suggestions. I mean, we potentially are talking about something that have managed to shape and change the history of Europe and then the extension of the world, right? Certainly John Dee had a, had a, had a major impact on, uh, on, well, a major impact. He had an impact on things like the formation of the British Empire and, uh, and the trend towards uh, Elizabethan exploration. Uh, he was a consultant to some of the explorers the Elizabethan explorers. He apparently made some improvements on um, navigational instruments of the period, and he was a popularizer of mathematics being taught widely to uh, non-scholars like seamen. Uh, he also did some work on astronomy uh, that is, you know, not really. It t turned out to be kind of a dead end. Uh, his big, biggest contribution, though, was probably his understanding and communicating to others that mathematics lay at the core of all the sciences. 
and uh, that when you take anything and reduce it, you can reduce everything down to to some way of looking at it with numbers. And that was really what made his fame as a scientist. Of course, he's probably more famous as the person who did this, you know, who turned away from science, although he didn't see it that way, of course. He saw it as just getting deeper into science. Um, so uh, his other work then later on became highly influential uh, and well-known, his magical work, and he is the real-life prototype for the character of Dr. Faustus in um, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, and also the prototype for the character of Prospero in Shakespeare's um, The Tempest. Mm -hmm. So he had a big, he had a large impact on 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 literature and on the you know, how people view um, that phenomenon of the period, and then later on. Uh, you look at the character of Gandalf. You just look at a picture of him. That's John D. The mm -hmm. big beard. The the you know the it's it's John D. Dumbledore. That's John D. So he set like a a pattern for this is what a magician should look like. Right. So yeah. almost every magician in literature today is derivative from. John D. and from and and so and from the visibility and from the knowledge that people had of him of, of who he was and and what he had done. Elizabeth's astrologer and a court magician. He's an alchemist. He has a lot of things. You know, as like a lot of the Renaissance folks are. They have a lot of uh, jack of all trades and they're very you know well versed in a lot of different things. Um, in the extension, as you've been looking into this, do you think that it's possible that? You know, kind of going back to what what I talked about earlier, that certain events in in European history, maybe speculation here, but some of the the, the victories of the uh, British Empire at the time. This is what I've heard other people suggest when they talk about D and his relationship to Elizabeth and everything. That it is partly due to his contact that he was, uh, how should we put it, endorsed, uh, helped along. He agreed to maybe do certain things and thereby help to advance the. The British Empire. Your thoughts? It was um, there's a um, a story that dates from significantly after the period that John Dee raised the storm that destroyed the British Armada. Right. That probably comes from the fact that the at one point the angels predicted that uh, that there was going to be an armada. Uh, well before an, uh, the Armada had taken place. The, that sounds really, wow, that's cool. I mean, they predicted the Armada, but it, it's not like it was a big secret that Spain was amassing ships and that Spain was going to invade England. So it, it's not all that amazing that they predicted it. The other thing that, they, that the angels predicted was the death of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. Again, not exactly a big leap of faith. She'd been imprisoned for almost a decade, I believe, at the time, and there was pretty much everyone was waiting for when they finally get a, get a way to do it away with her because she was a threat to the throne. But those are the two examples of predictions that the angels made that, that came true. Um, there were a lot of predictions that they made that didn't. Uh, the world did not end, for example. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor did not conquer all of Europe. So some of the things that they said just d didn't happen. But the way that it was explained was, well, it would have happened if they'd listened to us. Hmm. So that was kind of the, the, that's the way the angels explained it. If you'd listened, it would have happened. Interesting. Now, uh, we're going to take a break in a little while here. We're going to carry on the, in, the, in the second segment our, our member section but before we do that i wanted to ask you a little bit more here um, and then we'll make sure to give out your websites and book titles and everything else but uh is it or rather do you think that the angels uh had or have depending on if we still consider that someone is in c connection with them in some way but do they have an interest in in the human world do you think to meddle to change things to uh, you know, and if so, is that because there is a connection between our worlds? Does that benefit them in some way, just as, you know, 
we there could they could be benefiting from us if you know what i mean that's an interesting question um if you take what the angels said through Edward Kelly, literally, they're mostly just really, really annoyed at people. <laughs> uh, annoyed at um, the way people act, annoyed at the mistreatment of other people, annoyed at lack of belief. Uh, pretty much, that's the that's the tone you get from them. Is that like well, kind of like you feel like they want to shake human kind by the shoulders and say, "Wake up! Stop <laughs> doing this!" Well, seriously, it's it's really like that. Right. I mean, that there's a constant theme. Is uh, you know, is um, you know, reform yourself. You know, stop doing evil things. Start doing, you know, you know, it's 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 actually the the message is, you know, the world's going to end. Don't be evil, <laughs> and that's pretty much what the what the main message that that they seem to be communicating is. Google's tagline, I got it now. <laughs> Don't be evil, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so they kind of they think we're, I don't know, maybe maybe idiots, but do they understand anything about our predicament and the human condition that maybe gives reason for our behavior any any clues about that in there um i think that they seem to have a pretty good understanding about what was going on at the time i don't see any real signs that whatever that the word communicate any communications that really predicted the way things would be now on the other hand Many of the things that the angels promised D have come true, have actually happened. For example, we now can fly through the air. We now can communicate it instantaneously through fast distances. We now do have medicines that cure a large number and even most diseases. So you could argue, I suppose, that they in a way, not only predicted what was going to happen, but perhaps in some way they were uh, instrumental in it taking place. Well, I have much more I want to um, ask you about, Jeffrey. This is this is fascinating. Before we break, though, um, let's talk about if there's any websites that you'd uh, like to give out. No, just source, the, the one that they should check out is sorcerer.net. And uh, Sorcerer.net has links to where you can buy buy the books, both the Enochian and Evocation book and and Sorcerer. Uh, Sorcerer is available on Amazon, and um, and also it's available as an iBook and basically any format that you look for it, you can find it. And it's significantly cheaper in ebook format than it is in the uh, the paperback. Although the paperback is very nice, it's a it's a very high quality publication. So, so Sorcerer.net. And uh, if you look for Sorcerer, um, uh, uh, Space Elizabeth on Amazon, I believe it's, it's, it's a particular branch of the university. And uh, while I was there, I became interested in the uh, uh, concept of magical writings, you know, the writings, things that people had written, like magical workbooks, as a form of literature. And I uh, specifically got there through looking at Dr. Faustus, which was I thought a very, I thought the best Elizabethan play. I think it's superior in many ways to to Shakespeare's work. So I started becoming more interested in that, and then I discovered that there was a person, a real person, who lay behind Dr. Faustus. And it's not the German Dr. Faustus, who was actually a historical personage, but the character of Dr. Faustus in Marlowe's play is based on Dr. John Dee. And so I uh, started looking into biographies of John Dee and looking at um, what little pieces of his works were available. Now, this was in the early 1970s, which was a uh, kind of a time of great efflorescence of republishing of uh, old magical texts, both in their original and stuff from the Victorian period uh, that had been republished. And so there was a lot of activity around that. So I started collecting books on the subject. and ran across
All right, welcome to uh, the program, Jeffrey James. Uh, good to uh, talk to you and finally have you on the program. We've been uh, in contact for a little bit here for a while, so it's uh, it's nice to finally talk to you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. Now, uh, you come from the, uh, well, I guess the business world, we can say as well, Jeffrey. You're, you're a freelance writer, uh, but you do write you know, a blog about sales for CBS Interactive, a, a column for Inc.com. Uh, you've had your work published in Wired, the New York Times, and, and Computer World. So that's an interesting contrast to uh, your interest when it comes to uh, John Dee, Enochian Magic, etc. And now we have a new novel come, come out here called uh, Sorcerer a novel of Queen Elizabeth's alchemist. And uh, your previous book, Jeffrey, on the subject was The Enochian Evocation of John Dee. And uh, that's a reprint, as I understand it, of uh, your previous one called The Enochian Magic of Dr. John Dee, the most powerful system of magic in its original. So what was your initial interest in, in, in John Dee and Enochian magic, Jeffrey? Well, I uh, took, did my degree work in English at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, where I was uh, magna cum laude and uh, Rhodes Candidate Scholarship for, this, for the, the university. That is not too surprising. Interest in literature. Also, I was always interested in, in computers. And I had, um, I had computer time in college, you know, got a chance to use a computer, and, and uh, I thought it was very fascinating. So I became involved uh, professionally in the computer industry. And for 12 years, uh, worked in a development group, and then in another, for another seven years, worked in a marketing group. And so that allowed me to understand a lot about the about both about technology, but also about the way the business world worked. Because in the marketing world, I ended up working with a lot of CEOs and Fortune 500 companies and things like that. So, and while I and this was all kind of happening, you know, yeah, I kind of was looking at the mat, the magical stuff as as a hobby. And I had started working on a novel be on the subject because I thought this is a great story. I want to tell the story how it really was from the, their viewpoint. I'd already published the notebooks. Now I wanted to do a story. So that's where the novel was coming from. And then over the years, I've become uh, um, fairly well known as a writer on business and uh, sales and marketing, but also, uh, also high technology. I wrote a book called The Tao of Programming, which is that's right. yeah. per perennially popular. And uh, so, so that was my that that's been my career as a writer, and I'm I'm quite successful at it. And I have a, a, another book coming out in the called Business Without the Bullshit that's coming out in uh, in next next year from Business Plus, which is a big big imprint. And so I have this career as career as a writer and as a writer on on, on kind of corporate culture, but I still maintain an interest in the subject matter of John D. and his life. And I've been working on this novel, uh, draft after draft after draft, you know, kind of learning the craft of writing, learning how to tell a story, learning how to not make a novel bad history, but a good novel. Hmm. And so I ended up then uh, completing the novel, getting an agent for it, and getting a publisher. And uh, so now it's been published, and that's so that's and that's why we're talking now is because that's I'm I'm want people to, to, who are interested in the subject matter to be aware that the novel now exists and provides a key to understanding John Dee's work and, and, and the, the way that he practiced magic and the way that he thought about magic. Us, a book, a reproduction of a book that had been published in the mid-17th century of John Dee's diaries. And uh, very complicated, you know, this person said this and that, and I, it was this great mystery. I just said, well, what's this all about? So I started reading about it, and I subsequently started writing articles about the subject. This is while I, I actually while I was in college, and um, and continued continued it as a hobby for many years. Uh, and then in 1984, I think it was, I published um, the original version of the of the notebooks, uh, which was called, which was called Enochian Evocation, and that was um, that was published in. Uh, Hardback on acid-free paper on a hundred-year-old printing press with you know like the letter wow. press where they yeah it was nice. it's actually very cool and copies of that book now regularly go for five six hundred dollars yeah I saw that this is this amazing yeah they're very rare yeah. yeah it's very rare and it's remained in print it it was just remained in print and paperback pretty much ever since then um, but those original publications are really really quite valuable. Uh, in the meanwhile, while I was you know I graduated from college and uh, I'd always 
at the same time, it, 